Hi, everybody. Happy Black History Month. Welcome to the Greater Queens chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, this time virtual African-American reading. I'm Cheryl Wills, author and anchor for Spectrum News New York One. We're thrilled to have as our guest speaker today, author and CNN commentator, Bakari Sellers. We'll get to him in a moment, but first we want to invite and thank our sponsors who made today possible. Let's begin this virtual event with Dr. Karen Williams of York College. She's the Vice President for Enrollment Management and Student Affairs. Dr. Williams. Thank you so much, Ms. Willis. Good afternoon, everyone. I bring you greetings from President Berenicia Johnson Eanes, students, faculty, and staff of your college. My name is Dr. Karen Abigail Williams, and I am the Interim Vice President of Enrollment Management and Student Affairs. And I thank you for joining us today for the 2021 African American Reading. Your college has been participating every year in the African American Reading since Professor Charles Coleman brought the program to York more than 20 years ago. Later, we joined in partnership with the Greater Queens Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated to bring this impactful program to the community, to the Greater Queens Lynx, as you continue to lead with excellence and serve with grace. We at York thank you for your willingness to partner with us on this important program. The tradition of the African-American reading began as a national effort in 1990 by the Black Caucus of the National Council of Teachers of English. The National African-American reading is a groundbreaking effort to encourage communities to read together, centering African-American books and authors. This initiative was designed to make literacy a significant part of Black History Month, and it has reached more than 6 million participants around the world. This year, the college's YouTube page will also enable us to expand the African-American reading globally as we share our rich tradition of the history and our history through the art of storytelling. We are thankful that our speaker, noted attorney and history maker, Bakari Sellers, has agreed to sit down with award-winning anchor of New York One and author, Cheryl Willis to explore his memoir. As I conclude my welcome, I want to thank you again for joining us for what will be fascinating conversation. Take care, stay safe, and enjoy your afternoon. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for that. And we want to now quickly welcome the president of the Greater Queens Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, Paula Edme, to say a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the women of Greater Queens Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, I welcome you to the 2021 African American Read-In, which we are proud to co-host with our partner, York College. At its November 1989 meeting, the Black Caucus of the National Council of Teachers of English accepted the Issues Committee's recommendation that the Black Caucus sponsor a nationwide read-in on the first Sunday in February every year. After a decade of rigorous campaigning for participants, the African American Read-In became a traditional part of Black History Month. Hence, here we are today. Greater Queens Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated has a long-standing tradition of hosting the African American Read-In. We joined in partnership with JCAL and now York College, bringing life to the voices of African American writers. In the past, when we were able to convene in person, we featured a broad range of writers, such as the Honorable Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, 24th President of Liberia, Frank Savage, who served as Chairman of Alliance Capital Management, social justice advocate, Jane Bell, and our own Cheryl Wills, author of several books, most notably, Die Free, A Heroic Family History, Emma, and the Emancipation of Grandpa Sandy Wills. We've also featured aspiring young authors and poets from high schools, from across the city, and from CUNY colleges, providing them a platform for their creativity and for their spoken words to be heard. This afternoon, we're honored to have Cheryl, anchor and reporter for Spectrum News New York One, 
have a candid conversation with us and Bakari Sellers, a proud graduate of Morehouse, a politician, an esteemed attorney, a political commentator who we see on CNN on the regular, and author of My Vanishing Country. Thank you all this afternoon for joining us. Thank you, Spectrum News, for your support. And we are indeed in for an enlightening afternoon. Thank you for that. Well said. Thank you so much, Paula. And a big shout out goes out to my colleagues at Spectrum News, one of the sponsors of today's event. They made it possible for donations of my children's books about my great, great, great grandfather who fought in the Civil War as a slave. And it's been distributed to schools all across the country. So we're really proud to make that happen through this event. So I'd like to give my colleague, Janelle Johnson, Manager of Government and Community for Charter Communications as the parent company of Spectrum News to say a few words words. Janelle. Thank you, Cheryl. It is an honor to be a part of this wonderful and vitally important event today. In particular, I'm pleased to represent my company, Charter Communications, also, also known as Spectrum, as a sponsor for today's event. A special thanks goes out to the York College Black History Month Committee and the Greater Queens Chamber chapter excuse me, of the links for pulling today's event together. I'm so happy that Spectrum's own Cheryl Wells, reporter, anchor, host of In Focus, and all around Wonder Woman will be leading us through today's program. I am proud to say that my, that my company, Charter, embraces the foundations of diversity and inclusion in our business as we strive to deliver high quality products and services that exceed our customers' expectations. We embrace unique backgrounds, perspectives, and experiences of our employees and our partners. Our vision is to leverage the full diversity of our people and partners to make a meaningful difference. And our commitment to diversity is best exemplified in all that we do to celebrate Black History Month by like sponsoring today's event. Our Black History Month and Black History Month is a time of personal reflection and to remember that all of those who have come before us while lifting up and celebrating the heroes among us today, as we celebrate the more well-known figures of Black culture and influence, we also praise the strong and inspirational people who continue to break barriers and make sacrifices for us daily. And with that, I will turn it over back to Cheryl for the rest of our reading program. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, Janelle. thank you for that. And we'd like to quickly salute the first African-American man to lead the borough of Queens. Donovan Richards is here with us this afternoon. Please welcome him. Hi. Hey, Cheryl, good to see you. <laughs> and an honor to be here as the first black man to be the borough president. And I wanna welcome you all to this special virtual presentation of African-American readings with Cheryl Wills of New York One, my sister from the Rockaways originally, and with Bakari <laughs> Sellers. I gotta give it up for the Rockaways because you know we always gotta celebrate home. Uh, with Bakari Sellers, attorney, author, and CNN political analyst. I'd like to start off by also thanking York College for facilitating today's presentation. Located in the heart of Jamaica, Queens, York College is a central, is a center of educational excellence and has attracted and graduated some of the best and most highly motivated students from my area, my mother-in-law included. Uh, that makes York College the perfect facilitator for today's event as we celebrate Black History Month and discuss the importance of Black Americans being able to tell our own history and stories through the written word. With roots tracing to the 1920s, Black History Month was not formally established in the United States until 1976. The struggle to get Black History Month to be widely acknowledged mirrors the many struggles Black Americans have had in a country that still carries the legacy of slavery and is often plagued by racist violence, such as when the homes of Black families in Queens were bombed a few decades ago when these families began to move to the borough, and I'm a resident of Rosedale, and so I, I, I stand on their shoulders. These struggles still continue today as evidenced by the Black Lives Matter protests that took place last summer. And yes, Black lives do matter. 
In addition, many of the achievements of the historic black heroes that we celebrate today were often resented and hated at times they were taking place. Despite all this, black Americans have proven to be resilient, creative, and more than capable of achieving new heights and breaking barriers. We see that today in the recent elections of Kamala Harris as our vice president as, and, and Letitia James as our New York State Tur Attorney General and in the appointment of Lloyd Austin as our country's first black defense secretary. I, am pr I am myself am proud to follow in the footsteps of Helen Marshall, the first black person to be elected borough president of Queens Black History Month ensures that the accomplishments of black, his, black Americans are appropriately recognized and celebrated and that people of all backgrounds have an opportunity to learn about them. It also helps us to understand the importance of respecting people of all races and ethnicities because all of us have dignity as human beings and deserve to pursue our dreams and contribute to society as best we know how. Disrespect from this respect come from first being able to read and understand other people's stories. It is in that spirit that we gather here today for what should be a compelling discussion with Cheryl Wills, Bakari Sellers, whose recent book, My Vanishing Country, a memoir illuminates the lives of Americans, forgotten black working class men and women and offers an eye-opening journey through the South's past, present and future. I thank Cheryl and Bakari for taking part in this discussion. And I thank Charter Communications, the Greater Queens Chapter of the Links, and of course, your college for organizing this event. I hope everyone enjoys today's presentation and has a special and meaningful Black History Month this year. God bless you. So, good. oh, I dropped my, my phone, but so great to see you, Cheryl. And so great to see so many of you. God bless you. Happy Black History Month. Happy Black History Stay Month. Love, we love that you're rocking the dashiki on a Saturday afternoon. Okay. Looking good. Listen, ain't no shame in that. That's you know, we, we wear it proudly. <laughs> oh, good to see you, my friend. Good to see, good to see you. you. Okay. And just a quick housekeeping note for everyone. Two quick things. Number one, we welcome your comments in to the right of your screen. Get those questions in. I'm going to pop them in whenever I can. And Bakari's book is amazing. And we are going to gift them to a lot of you on with us right now, but you got to stay to the end to find out how you're going to get it. Gotcha. Don't go away. Stay with us to the end. Okay. Now with that, it's truly an honor to introduce Bakari Sellers. He's a lawyer and a very popular commentator on CNN. And he's the author, as so many have said, of the exciting new memoir. It's so deep, it's so compelling, My Vanishing Country. And welcome, Bakari. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here with you on the Saturday afternoon. Uh, you know, this is a, a privilege and a pleasure. And I'm from the big city of Denmark, Miss Cheryl. And, um, <laughs> We have three stoplights and a blinking light. And my mom and dad always tell me that the two most important words in the English language are the words, thank you. Yeah. And they're not nearly said enough. And so, um, you know, from this amazing institution, uh, shout out to the links, um, you know, to have the, the borough president uh, give a warm welcome to be in your presence. Um, give Errol Lewis my best as well. Um, you know, it's just an awesome feeling. So I just want to say thank you in the words of the great American poet from New York, Sean Carter, also known as Jay-Z. Oh, yeah. uh, you could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here with us this evening. So let's have fun. Um, and just thank you for joining us. Yeah, listen, you are of all the commentators and there's a lot. I, I started in the business with your colleague, uh, Don Lemon. You are my favorite. I'm not. <laughs> favorite. Well, I, you, you know what? I will say thank you. But I will also say there ain't enough of us. That's right. And, and so we right. we I talked to my friend Angela Rye, who actually um, is is spending a lot of time on MSNBC now. Um, but we always talk about the fact that you know we we have to be on our A games because it's just not a lot of us. And that's my goal when I leave um, when I leave CNN. Whenever that time comes, I want to make sure that um, I open that door and kick that door down so there can be many more people who look like us sitting in those chairs. 
Yes, sir. Proud of you for that. Now, I want to dig into your book, but of course, I also want to get your perspective on the Capitol riots, what's happening now in Washington, what's happening with the Republican Party. But let's start with your book, My Vanishing Country. And you know, the cover of you as a kid truly speaks volumes. Talk to us about how your upbringing relates to the very title of this book, My yeah. Vanishing Country. What message are you trying to convey? So there are a couple of things. that There are two large themes that we tried to convey. That picture is, is an innocence. Um, it's kind of weird. I see that same innocence. And I have to apologize because my twins are sleeping right now, which is why I'm thankful that this program is at this time, but they may wake up and join us at any time. They're two years old, Sadie and Stokely. Uh, but when I look back into Stokely's eyes, I see a lot of that same innocence. And that picture, I was yeah. six years old. I was on my way to uh, summer league basketball. And my father is somebody who takes pictures of us all the time. Um, and I was just sitting on at 633 Frederick Street in, in Denmark. And it was an amazing place to grow up because we didn't know what we didn't have. Um, and, you know, one of the things we wanted to do with this book was flip the notions of, um, you know, rural um, working class being code for white and urban meaning black, um, because I know some many rural working class black folk um, and I wanted to be able to share their stories. I wanted to be, that, be able to share the stories of the women who um, who who sit on the second row of of the church and wear the big hats and they cook the pies that have the two sticks of butter in it, uh, the coconut and sweet potato pies with all that butter. And when you hug them, uh, you smell like Chanel number no. five for the rest of the day. Um, but they're the backbone of your communities. They're the political power in your communities. They lift you up and fill you up with so much sustenance. I wanted to tell the stories of the civil rights heroes that we don't learn about um, because we, we have a relatively violent curriculum when it comes to the miseducation of black folk in this country. Um, and from a, you know, from a, a macro level, um, being black in this, <clears throat> in this country, I wanted to talk about the promises, um, not just life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but the very tangible realities of love, hope, truth, justice, and peace that are, are vanishing before our eyes for many people of color. And on the, the micro level, um, growing up in the poor rural South after um, NAFTA and CAFTA in the early 90s, um, where many of our manufacturing um, plants and textile mills left, um, uh, you know, growing up in a food desert where many people don't even know what that is, but you can't go two, three miles and get access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Growing up in a community where we don't even have potable water. Um, you know, many people live in communities where, especially down there where they have, um, where they have, uh, you know, brownfields or you're in, inhaling unclean air. We lost our hospital in 2010. Um, so just where that, that grip of, of poverty is placing its grasp on both our newborn and elderly alike and escaping that trap of impoverishment has become synonymous with the proverbial dog that chases his tail. Oh. I wanted to be able to tell that story um, and, and share it with the world so they knew what it meant to be black in America from a different perspective. You know, you write a lot about your dad and your grandfather in this book. And you you mentioned that your grandfather told your father, who was a civil rights activist during the civil rights movement, please don't be a dead, a dead hero. Please don't be, that struck me when I saw that. Please, to, a father telling his son, please don't be a dead hero. Share with our audience the dynamics of your family during this stressful time during the civil rights movement that you saw through the lens of a little kid. So my grandfather was, he was almost prophetic because my father almost ended up being a dead hero. He was, he was very, very close. I think a bullet a two inches in another direction and, and that, that prophecy would have been fulfilled. My father started in the movement in 1955. I mean, I, I say started, he got the, he became knowledgeable of the world around him in, in 1955. That was when, um, if we remember, um, you know, you, you, you didn't go viral um, on IG or Snap or Twitter. Uh, you went viral on Ebony, in Ebony Magazine. And that's when Mamie Till had the strength and courage and audacity to put her son um, Emmett in an open casket so that the world could see what hate, bigotry, xenophobia and racism had done to her son. And my father was 
a part of that Emmett Till generation. And it was very, it was, it was a lot of tension between my father and um, his parents that were very middle class. Um, you know, we, my grandparents owned a motel, they had a cab company and they had a little juke joint to sell fish sandwiches, right? And so they were middle class in Denmark and Denmark at that time had, you know, it was very rare because it, it was a small city that was growing so rapidly and black folk had some semblance of wealth because uh, you had railroad tracks that went north, south, east and west, hmm. which was very rare um, in the south. And you had two historically black colleges, Denmark Area Trade Center and Voorhees College. But my father chose the path of activism. And so he started leading marches and sit-ins and understanding and learning from not just Emmett Till, but people like George Elmore who lost everything, you know, trying to get the right to vote and many others. Um, you can understand the angst that my grandparents had with my father's activism, not just for his physical well-being, but their well-being as well. And so uniquely enough, this has all the irony in the world. They wanted to get him out of the movement. So they sent him to Howard University, which makes no sense to anybody. Uh, and when he got to Howard, he became a roommate with Stokely Carmichael. Oh, wow. Who was his best friend. Uh, Stokely, um, you know, was was from uh, uh, Trinidad by way of, of the Bronx. Um, and went to Howard University and, and Stokely and my dad, that story is, is written, uh, you know, in blood since mm. uh, my father w went to prison, um, prison, you know, a lot of, he went to jail a lot. They all went to jail a lot, but he went to prison twice, once for, um, evading the draft. Uh, he, he decided he, he didn't want to go, uh, to a war that he thought was unjust only to be treated like a second class citizen when he came home. Um, he served a few months then, and then the uh, second time was for the Orangeburg Massacre, uh, February 8th of 68, where South Carolina State Troopers shot um, and killed three students, Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton. They wounded another 28. My father was shot that night. Um, he was arrested because he was a member of SNCC. They deemed him to be an outside agitator. Um, they housed him on death row after they denied his bond, later granted him a bond. Um, but they charged him, tried him, and convicted him of rioting. He became the first and only one man riot in the history of this country. Wow. Um, my father went to prison. And that's, you know, just the beginning of my story um, and just a part of, uh, you know, it's a part of being a child of the movement and growing up in the South that you um, you have these relationships with that struggle. Yeah. How's your dad now? Great. I was talking to him this morning. He's in his uh, 70s, right? Yeah, he is. Uh, let's see. He was born in '44, so right. oh yeah, he's 70, 76. Yeah, my mom so, around there too. So your dad's in his mid seventies. He lived through Jim Crow, and he lived to see you, his son, elected to the South Carolina State Legislature at twenty two. You are to be commended for that. Twenty. Yes. You may history, <laughs> my brother. How did you pull that off? Uh you know, I, that's a good question. Um, I remember when I came downstairs and told my mom and dad I was running for the South Carolina State House of Representatives. I had literally, I wasn't, it was the summer of, of 2005. I was still 20 when I um, made this decision. A baby. And my mom said she would vote for me. My dad said he'd think about it. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I, uh, I ran against somebody who was 82 years old and he had been in office for 26 years. Um, before he was in the state house, he was chair of the county council. Before he was chair of the county council, he delivered the mail. And before he delivered the mail, he delivered the milk. So he knew everybody. Hmm. And I had to wait until September 18th of 2005, which was my 21st birthday, to announce my candidacy for office. I actually won June 13th. I became the youngest black elected official and youngest state legislator. I was the youngest person to ever won an election in South Carolina. Um, at the age of 21. And then I got seated when I was 22 that November. And um, I, you know, I believe in fundamentally, um, you know, meeting people where they are. Uh, we went to over 55 churches and we knocked on over 2,600 doors. Now, let me explain, because we got a lot of city folk on, on there. And I had to explain this to Cory Booker one time because, you know, he wanted them Newark city folk. When I say knock on a door, like we don't have places down here where people live on top of each other. Like it's knock on a door. You drive a mile and then you knock on another door. <laughs> and so, you know, we knocked on doors with Confederate flags. We knocked on doors wow. with dogs in the front. You know, some people would tell you to go to hell. Some people would try to get you to wow. date their daughter. It was everything. It was everything in between. I mean, it was a fascinating experience. But um, at the end of the day, there were so many people who came up to me and said, I don't believe you're going to win. 
but I voted for you anyway. And we had the highest voter turnout at that time since like Jimmy Carter. It was wow. it was crazy. Um, and we made history. And it was just a it was a fat. It was, a, you know, I, I will never go back to anyone's state legislature. I can tell you that much. But it was a fascinating eight years of service. And then running statewide in 2014 was fascinating as well. Yeah, well, you know, I want to frame this through the lens of your father seeing you make history in South Carolina. He saw the first black president, Barack Obama, of course. Now he's seen the first woman of color vice president, Kamala Harris. Sadly, he also saw in real time what happened at Mother Emanuel Baptist Church. He saw just last month on January 6th, a, a, a mob storm the Capitol with his son speaking truth to power in real time on a national network. How do you process all of these current events through the lens of your father? So that's a good question. So I, let's take it kind of one step at a time. I remember back when Melissa Harris Perry was hosting Saturdays and Sundays on MSNBC, before I got hired by CNN, I was, we were standing in front of Mother Emanuel Church um, in 2015. It was hot. And I don't know if y'all been to Charleston, but Charleston, a different type of heat right there. It was hot. And we're standing there and we're doing a live TV interview. And I, at the time, my dad was 70 and I was 30. And we just I looked at my dad and I said that the, the greatest indictment of the United States of America is that my father is 30 years. Um, uh, excuse me. My father is 70 and I'm 30. And we're sharing too many of the same experiences, whether or not it's Emmett and his generation or Medgar. Uh, whether or not it's, it's Goodman, Turner and Cheney, or whether or not it was Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond and Delano Middleton. And for me, it was Tamir. To me, it was Alton Sterling. To me, it was, it was Keith Lamont and Walter Scott. Um, you know, the list goes on and on and on, Sandra Bland, et cetera. Um, for him, it was the 16th Street Baptist Church. For me, it was Mother Emanuel. Um, and, you know, when the Confederate flag came down, because no one thought in South Carolina during our lifetimes a Confederate flag would ever come down. It took the bloodshed and, and the lives of nine individuals for that flag to come down. I always tell folk that every ounce of change we ever had in this country is because of black blood. And don't ever forget that. Um, and, um, you know, he didn't come to the he didn't come to the, the rally um, or the ceremony where we took the flag down. I was just hired by CNN. So I was Don's anchor buddy. So the world was watching and we were sitting there. We were commentating side by side on it. And my father was like, you know, this is yours now. Um, this is your movement. This is your struggle. Uh, my father was in Kiowa. He had his feet up. Uh, he was at the beach. And he said, I'm very confident in this next generation of leaders. And, you know, you were part of that. And the movement always has to grow. You know, my father, unlike my father, and many people in SNCC um, who grew in the movement, are unlike many black folk um, uh, in terms of allowing for young people to lead and the growth that's necessary to sustain movements. I think that not only in the black church, but also um, in black politics, we have a, a problem with quote unquote, passing a mantle or passing a baton, which is why many times that gets snatched or taken and it causes for friction intergenerationally instead of building and cultivating leaders to come behind you. That's a whole nother uh, conversation. Um, so that's that's the talk about the, the 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 Charleston massacre. When you talk about the the pride that he has with Barack Obama and Kamala, he actually he 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 has a great deal of pride in Barack Obama. He never thought we would have a black president like many people in his generation. I will tell you something. South Carolina is the first primary in the South um, after Iowa. Uh, New Hampshire, Nevada, come South Carolina. It's also the first time black folk get a chance to have an input. That's why every time on TV, I'm always like, you know, Iowa, New Hampshire. And I mean, they don't matter. I mean, it, Clark County matters a lot in Vegas because it's a bunch of black folk in, in Clark County. But until black folk vote, none of this matters. Uh, my mama and her friends, Lynx, AKAs, you know, Divine Nine. I mean, that's who determines who the Democratic nominee is going to be. Um, and it was funny back in 2008, I shared with you all an anecdote that I shared in my story that, um, I mean, it's shared in my book that I was on a call with uh, Steve Hildebrand. Uh, I believe Axe might've been on the call. Michelle Obama was on the call. Um, Anton Gunn from South Carolina, a lot of the South Carolina leadership was on the call. And um, there were two concerns from black folk, my father's generation about voting for Barack Obama. One was that they didn't believe white folk were gonna vote for him, oh. which was soothed by Iowa. 
um, after Iowa, that changed. And number two, they thought that they were going to kill him. And you got to understand, coming from a generation where all of their heroes have become martyrs, um, that was a very real concern um, for them. And so he had a great deal of pride in Barack. He loves, loves, loves Kamala. I think it's cultural for a lot of us. Um, you know, having that HBCU experience, you know, being an AKA, um, I just think, you know, for him, he, you know, the politics of the day was dictated by black women and Fannie Lou, um, black women like uh, Ruby Doris Wright, Judy Richardson, uh, black women like Ella Baker. And so he sees her, he knew Shirley Chisholm very well. He sees her in that same kind of um, mold and stature. Um, and so, you know, that's just that's just where we are. And with the insurrection, my father's like most most black folk, which is like we knew this. Was, I mean, we tried to tell y'all. So, I mean, like this ain't this on y'all. This ain't really on us. I mean, we we knew this was going to happen. We could have told you this was going to happen. We predicted it. Uh, and so here we are. Yeah. So I, I, your commentary on January 6th echoed what so many black folks were thinking. And you know what got me, Bakari? through all of that was when I heard people screaming, we built this Capitol. <laughs> I wanted to jump. Well, first you did. <laughs> I was like, well, first you didn't, but you know, you know, let me, let me go back and let's analyze this though. Since we have a, you know, we have a York college and we, we have some, hopefully some young people, if not, maybe they'll watch a recording and we have a lot of politically active folk. I think that we have to analyze it. Um, a little deeper than we have. So hmm. I look at Charlottesville um, and the uprising, whatever you want to call it in Charlottesville, with, which led to the death of Heather Heyer. And I look at um, January 6th through the same lens. And I'll ask you this, what was the most, um, what what portion of that stuck out to you the most? What was it, I mean, was it the hate, the vitriol, whatever it what may be, but what stuck out to you the, to the most about both of those incidents? Yeah, well, the, you know, being, white men scream, we built this capital, just made my skin crawl because actually that's a rewrite of history. But you know what also got me? What got me was seeing how this country in a post 9-11 world were prepared for terrorists, but it turns out they were prepared for other they were not prepared for people who look like their sons and daughters. And I'm, I'm from New York City, right? So New York City is literally ground zero. Yeah. And the, we, our city hall is a fortress. I'm sure it's not like that in, in South Carolina. No. So, so we know how the preparation and how this country and especially New York City has prepared after 9-11 and on the ready. And they just walked in. Yeah. They just walked in. Not only did they walk in, but they walked out. They didn't yeah. run as if they felt they did something wrong. That was the most, that's what got me. That that's that's impressive. That that's right up there. I think the number one thing though is that they didn't wear hoods or masks. There you go. I think that when you when you see that level of anti-Semitism, when you see people, they were they were uh uh they would wear the the shirts that said uh six uh um six wme which meant yeah. six million wasn't enough right i'm um, in reference to the holocaust or you see the confederate flag being flown in the capital first of all if i show up at a rally and somebody got zip ties i'm like nah i'm going home this ain't this ain't i'm not built for this this ain't what i came here for like there's a, there's a certain level of, of disconnect but the fact that they didn't wear hoods they didn't wear masks i mean I, i'm old enough I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to remember when racism wasn't cool, right? right. When you kind of, so now I, I remind folk that this era, um, we didn't just find racism, but now it's emboldened to a point where people have traded in their hoods for, for megaphones and, and Brooks Brothers clothing and cable news shows. How did we get here, Bakari? How did we get to this level of boldness where, to your point, not only did they not wear hoods, they live streamed it for the world and their family and friends. Yeah. One dude, one dude even had a lanyard with this, with this, he, he, I guess he came on his lunch break. He had his, he, he had his, his work lanyard on. How did we get here? Um, I think we got here and I, I think we got here by, by never addressing the issue of race in this country. I think we got here um, by never addressing um, the issues that, that many of us have been talking about till we're blue in the face for a long period of time. 
And it, let me just say, I mean, I, we have to define racism, I think, whenever we're talking about it, because racism isn't somebody calling me nigger. I mean, all you got to do is go in my, you know, just go in my, my mentions and you see that every day. Oh. But racism to, to, to um, utilize Stokely Carmichael, he would say that if you want to lynch me, that's your problem. But if you have the power to lynch me, that's my problem. Um, so racism is a power construct. And we're talking about systems of oppression. We're talking about educational injustices, environmental injustices, a criminal justice system that we know is broken, lack of access to capital and resources. And so I see somebody commented um, Trump and I'm like, no, that, that's that's an easy cop out. Um, um, Trump Trump is a system of the cancer. He ain't he's not the cancer. Um, we had racism. Reveal, though. What did Trump reveal? During oh, re re he revealed, you know, it's kind of like when you get a fever, right? You know, then you know you're sick. <laughs> like you've been sick for a while. This infection has been ruining your body for a while. But I think that Donald Trump, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, you add an arsonist to a fire. I mean, he helped pour gasoline on what we knew to be true, his words, his incitement, et cetera. But I think it's too easy when we just say Trump. I don't think that that allows us uh, first of all, I think it gives them too much credit first. Second, I don't think it allows us to truly diagnose the ills of this country. Flint, Michigan was before Trump, right? I mean, let, let's talk about that. A quarter of shame where kids go to school and their heating and air don't work, where their infrastructure is falling apart. The number one, the number one cause of children not performing well in schools in South Carolina is hunger, oh. right? Hunger, right? So, I mean, when we were taught, when we were going through the virtual school, every the biggest issue we had in South Carolina was not people being one. We don't have broadband. So that was a huge issue everywhere. But number two was where were kids going to eat because we they weren't going to school. I mean, so let's and many of the, the overwhelming majority of them are black. So let's t I mean, these type of societal, cultural, systemic issues have just gone unaddressed for so long. And then you throw in the the mix of when you like it's like we're baking a, a racism cake here. You throw in some social media where people get the you know the fat dudes get to sit in their grandma's basement and be in these chat rooms eating Cheerios off their stomach and type away. Um, and you you have cable news and you have Sean Hannity and you have uh, 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 Tucker Carlson just giving this a platform and giving this breath. Um, then it, it's a perfect recipe. Um, for what we saw on January 6th. Yeah, it's a perfect storm. You know, you said that you just go in your mentions and you'll see the N-word, people calling you all manner of names. And as you well know, members of Congress are, are being, actually on, from both sides of the aisle, their lives are being threatened. They have made a public appeal that they need more security. How are you my friend, and how, you know, what does it do to your psyche knowing that people are calling you the N-word on the regular? That and doesn't do, that doesn't do anything to me. Really? No, I don't, I mean, no, I mean, I, I, I think that, see, I mean, I, I don't, to, to use, to use some phraseology from my good friends in New York, you know, you just cut from a different cloth and there is, there, there is th those, those things don't affect me. What exhausts me are seeing more black bodies in the streets, the, the George Floyds, the Tamir Rices. Uh, you know, what exhausts me is is seeing Daniel Rittenhouse being able to murder two people, walk by police with an AR-15 and go home. What exhausts me is Dylan Roof, after killing nine people, including one of my good friends, go to Burger King. Like, And the cops bought him Burger King. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, those are the things that exhaust me. You know, throughout this pandemic, you know, having to tell people, um, you know, you know, <laughs> um, it, people are like, why are black folk dying? They should just take some personal responsibility. And I'm like, no, when you when you live in a food desert. Right. And that means you're more likely to go to a grocery store and get a pound of sugar and 10 packets of Kool-Aid. And that way you add water and it stretches for a week. With that, you're more likely to have higher instances and probabilities of diabetes, right? Um, you you don't have the fresh fruits and vegetables. You can't go get. I mean, I, I'm from a community where you know we have 13 year olds who've never seen a dentist. We have women who are 45 and 50 who've never had a mammogram because of access to care, right? So those are the things that that I focus on. Those are the systems. I don't worry about the words. The ignorance is very. The ignorance is, is, has always been prevalent, but now people through social media and other means um, have, have, have felt more comfortable and, 
and, and showing their ignorance. I mean, that that's that's all I can attribute that to. Right. Let's talk about the path forward, because we all know what happened on January 6th and all the tragedies in George Floyd. But it looks like President Trump, uh, former President Trump is not going to be held accountable for inciting this riot on January 6th. What message is that saying to communities of color that something so blatant could happen where he literally said, I'm going with you to the Capitol. I don't think that when the history books are written, anyone's going to doubt his role in this. But it looks like he is going to walk away from this scot-free. What does that do to the psyche of communities of color? And how do we explain this to our children? I mean, I think our children know. I think most Black folk on this call know what's going to happen. And that we don't have to educate them on the fact that two systems of justice. You know, for us, this isn't a this isn't an educating moment. This is a reinforcement thereof. I mean, I don't. I I, I would, you know, one of the more one of the more thought provoking. Uh, there are two social experiments that I would suggest everyone do. One is very simple: watch American Skin, which I watched last night. It was a fascinating movie by Nate Parker, starring Nate Parker. Just take an hour and a half and watch it with your your black children, particularly black boys. Um, wouldn't necessarily recommend you watch it around white folk because you're going to feel some sort of way. You know, some, sometimes you watch these shows and you need about 10, 15 minutes or a day to re, regroup. regroup. Uh, but the second thing is, you know, I, I urge people to spend, you know, 30 minutes a day for one week watching Fox and Friends. Oh. The next week, spend 30 minutes a day watching Morning Joe. And then the next week, watch 30 minutes of New Day or whatever it is. And you will get it's a very interesting thought and social experiment. You will get at least two very stark perspectives on the way people see the world. It's startling. It's frightening almost. Um, and when you when you put that lens on on what um, on, on on what Donald Trump did and just and you think about black experiences, you know, I just go back to Kenny Stills and Colin Kaepernick and and even my good friend Stefan Gilmore, many people being called sons of bitches for taking knees. Yeah. But but the president is a patriot. And it's weird to me because people confuse their patriotism with prejudice all the time. And that is the country that we live in. And we just have to be able to understand that and we have to be able to call it out. And we need more white folk and particularly calling it out to other white folk because while we may have a great message, we are not the right messenger sometimes. And if nobody hears anything else I say, I want all the black folk to understand that it ain't on us to cure racism. That is not our burden to bear. We have enough burdens in this country and that ain't one of them. Bravo. Before we get to uh, the questions, there's some wonderful questions and comments coming in. You know Kamala Harris well, and she is in a very unique uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that! <laughs> Wait, did you create that or? No, it's a it's an essential. This fear of God. It's a young man, Jared Lorenzo, who wow. this actually has a picture of Kamala at, on the back at Howard University. This that is, is dope. Okay. Yeah, you got to figure out how to get that. <laughs> but uh, you know Kamala very well, the vice president, and she is in uncharted territory. It's like she's thrown into the middle of a fire. We got the pandemic and we got the racism and we got so much going on. What do you want to see from the vice president, Kamala Harris, in her first 100 days? You know, I I, I am very, first of all, I, I just want to protect her. Just not, I mean, she's going to be, I mean, I don't mean like, Oh, I know. It's right. Yeah. But I just want to like protect her from just the utter like BS she's going to have to deal with. You know, you I just think about Michelle Obama, the, like wearing her wearing her arms out or not wearing stockings or something like that. I mean, I just want to protect her and allow her to do her job because she's going to flourish. This is someone who ha had, has never lost an election. This is someone who has had more experience than many on state, local and now federal levels of government. Um, I appreciate the fact that the president of the United States is a, it's, is really taking this as a partnership and she's they are everywhere together. Um, I think that she is going to play a unique role. You saw her going to West Virginia, even 
even having to push Joe Manchin and Joe, Joe wanted to talk back, but you know, Joe voted the right way after Kamala went to West Virginia to put pressure on um, passing, um, passing the, the $1.9 trillion stimulus through reconciliation. I, I do think though, the way that COVID has affected black folk, both economically and from a public health perspective, her face and leadership on this issue is gonna be very important. Um, and I just look forward to them using her in the best possible way. And I think that it's incumbent upon all of us just to pray for her protection. Yeah. A question here from Crystal Bonds, Mr. Sellers, when you speak with your dad, given his activism work, Crystal asks, what are his views on the Black Lives Matter movement? My dad loves the Black Lives Matter movement. He, he called me at the Baton Rouge. I don't know if at the Alton Sterling died. Might see my, this is the way my daddy worked. Yeah. And he said, man, you know, you know that, you know that D-Ray boy, right? That, by the way, that's not his name, it's D-Ray. But he said, you know that D-Ray boy, right? I said, yes, sir, I do, daddy. <laughs> he said, man, get him on the phone. I said, what you want to tell him? He said, man, y'all got to stop protesting at night. He mm-hmm. said, one of the things we learned in SNCC is that you never protest at night because mm-hmm. people, he meant law enforcement, do things under the cover of darkness they would never do during the day. He said, it's for your own safety. So, I mean, I know that. I mean, he's been telling me that since I was like, if you're going to have a protest and you want Bacardi to show up, we're going to protest during the day. At 6.30, I'm out. I ain't protesting with you at night. I'm not doing that. So they, they can knock me off, or hit me across the head and sprinkle some crack on me. I am not doing that with y'all. So, you know, he he he's so engaged. He, he protest is messy. He's like, people are going to make mistakes and, you know, people aren't going to like this or like that. But he is so engaged and so proud of the young people who were part of the movement today uh, that his heart swells and it just makes him feel as if you know he his his work his life's work is not in vain yeah you know you told the washington post uh when they did a review of your book you told them to be black in this country is to live in a perpetual state of grief explain what you mean by that I mean, I, you know, I, I just use my family as an example. Um, you know, my father gets in the movement around 55 as a, as, at 10 years old. You know, he leads marches and sit ins. He he deals with that pain of losing so many loved ones and going to jail and being beaten, working for eight dollars a week. My mom was was a part of the uh, integrating class of Hamilton High School in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, she's seven years younger than my dad, but you know, just having that experience. My father went to prison. My sister was born while my father was in prison. I'm um, just having that pain of a, a woman having to carry a child, um, um, you know, by her, um, by herself. Um, um, then, you know, my father gets out of prison. He's a black man in the South. Um, that in itself, black man in the South with. Um, a felony. Um, it's extremely tough. So my mother has to be the breadwinner. Um, she has to carry the family. Um, and just, you know, living those experiences and then having a son and a, and a family trying to raise them uh, and seeing the experiences we go through, it becomes cyclical. And so, you know, for, for most black folk in this in this country, you know, as we as we go through life, we it's like we see one dead body. We see it. We visualize it. We see it. The world sees it. There's outrage, there's there's anger, there's protest. Uh, then there's another one. And then there is a, you know, a lack of accountability for the first one. So then that rage and outrage persists from the first one. And then you have the same lack of accountability for the second one. So all of that rage, it bubbles back up and then you have another body. And that's that's the cycle that we try to break. And that's what I have to do. And that's my life's work so that my kids don't have to live that same life. Yeah, and that's another question I have. What kind of America do you want to see for your twins? I just want them to be free. Um, you know, I, I said this the other day. Now you don't feel they're free now. Oh, I mean, no, it's tough out here. To, you you can't be you you can't be free to be yourself. You can't be free to love. You can't be free to do things. Justice is real, right? Justice is a verb. Justice is fleeting for us. Justice is not a verb for us. Um, you know, my daughter, she's fifteen. Um, um, you know, I, re- I recall um, during George Floyd, she um, made this huge sign and she went outside and she protested with her girlfriends. They put on masks and they had, you know, Black Lives Matter and other signs. And it's such a conflicting um, 
point because you're so proud that your daughter's protesting on one hand. But on the other hand, you wish your daughter could be like Baron Trump, right? Which is just be any other 15 year old and not have to reaffirm the basic tenets of our humanity on a sign outside protesting. And so that's just where we have to go. I mean, it, are we? Yeah, I mean, we got the we got the 64 and 65 Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act after they killed King. We got the 68 Fair Housing Act. And, you know, I, I those things those things are true. But, you know, we still have so far to go. Yeah. Dr. Marcia Keys asks, please, Mr. Sellers, which direction will you go for your next book as he ponders the theme of January 6th? That's kind of um, that's a good question because we we are writing it right now. Um, Harper Collins. Harper Collins. I'm a star. Shout out to Tracy Sherrod and Patrick Bass for yeah. giving me an opportunity, believing in me, um, and making me the first New York Times bestseller from from Denmark, South Carolina. So I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm happy I'm happy for that. And thank you for every all of you all who who bought the book and supported me. I have a children's book coming out uh, on the children's imprint of Harper Collins in, in January of twenty. Uh, 15, I mean, January 15th of 2022, but then we have an adult book coming out later in the year and we're exploring a lot of those themes. It's going to be more of a political analysis, of course, than, than memoir like this one, but it's going to, uh, um, we're going, we're going to try to be more prescriptive and more forward, forward looking, um, giving, giving, you know, I want it to be more hopeful, but, um, policy driven prescriptive manual for how we get to where we want to go. What does the future look like from your point of view for the Republican Party? Is it Trump's party, as uh, Congresswoman Green has asserted? Has he hijacked the party? No, he didn't hijack. It was given to him. Um, hijack insinuates that he took something that wasn't his. I mean, that that underbelly of racism and bigotry that, you know, and he also pulled up so. He also pulled off one of the biggest cons we've seen him. I, I can't wait to analyze this and dig deep and read people who are smarter than I who write about it. Because one of the things he did was he he convinced um, he's somebody who has golden toilets in his house mm -hmm. and he convinced poor white folk he could speak for them. That's a fascinating thought. I mean, you just think about that connection. Um, and I, I don't I, I don't know how he pulled that off. Um, I also don't believe, and I think one of the things that people are coming around, I do not believe in economic anxiety. Remember, we were hearing a lot about that. I think that we have cultural anxiety in this country. There were a lot of people, a lot of folk who felt like because the browning of America, black folk, would, would, black and brown people were replacing them. And that fear um, led them to to propel Donald Trump. So, yeah, this is his party, um, you know, I. Uh, Congresswoman Green is, uh, uh, is first of all, it's it's interesting. We we call her Congresswoman, um, you know, somebody who um, believes that they're the Jewish space lasers that cause forest fires. Um, someone who who echoed the sentiments of assassinating Nancy Pelosi. Um, you know, all they did was take away her committee assignments. No, all, all Democrats did was take oh, away her committee oh, assignments. Republicans, plus 11 Republicans, but for the most part. They rallied okay. around her. This, we are, are we in uncharted territory with what's yes. happening in Washington? In this country, we are. I, but you know what's crazy, Ms. Cheryl, and I hate this. People keep talking about this being unprecedented. For my anxiety, I need to get back to precedent at times. I just want some normalcy. Let's just get back to, to, to some regular charted territory and some regular precedent at times. You can have the uncharted and the un instability that later. I just want to get back. And I don't mean normalcy. Right. In the sense of, of, of you know, where, where we were as, as black folk. But I just mean, uh, you know, not having the angst and worry of what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. And, you know, uh, but we have a few minutes left and a lot of people are saying, oh, they were shocked by the mob storming the Capitol. When we talk about things being a precedent, black life has always dealt with mob storming their communities. We dealt with it in Tulsa. We, I'm in New York. We dealt with it during the New York draft riots in 18. Yeah. 
1963. We dealt with it in Rosewood. We dealt with it in so many communities. But this was like some news flash. Black folks have been dealing with mobs like this since we got here. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, there, there's nothing new uh, about this. I think that, you know, it's interesting to see. And people, for me, the newness will be, the new element will be, people want us to turn the page and start healing. Yeah. And Black folk have all, uh, always placed in this country in a posture of forgiveness. Like, what do y'all, I mean, y'all just got to forgive and move on. No. And I'm not a pastor. And I, I know that that we have some 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 good leaders, especially from places like Abyssinia and others up there, my Morehouse brothers. And I, I'll leave the pastoring to them. But I, I will say that from the scriptures I read, you can't get to um, any level of forgiveness without atonement. And there's never there's never we ne we've never had that accountability. We've never had that atonement. So I'm interesting to see if we get that after January 6th. Hmm. An interesting question here from Randall Pearson. What is the theme of Bakari? That's an interesting way to put it. What is the theme of Bakari? Yeah, I don't know the answer. That's an, that's an interestingly posed question. Yeah. Um, what does your future look like? Are you going to return to public? Yeah, I, I will. I will return to politics. I'm sure. Well, I mean, if the people will have me, and ain't, ain't too many certainties in politics. But I, I am just really happy. I mean, I, you know, focusing on being a husband and a father yeah. are, are the toughest things right now. And, um, you know, just working extremely hard, practicing law, being on TV, writing books and speaking to awesome groups like this. I, I'm you know, I am taking it. I. I always tell folk my anxiety limits me from being someone who thinks five and 10 years ahead. I'm someone who thinks in 24 hour spurts. I, I really want to make the most of this day. I want to make the most of this moment. I am someone who uh, adheres to the, you know, I can only eat this apple one bite at a time. Yeah. And before we let you go, and again, we are purchasing your books to give away all of our, to some of our attendees. Um, a lot of people were shocked when Georgia flipped blue. It hadn't done that since Carter, of course. But you know what I think a lot of people fail to appreciate? That there's been a reverse migration to Georgia. I didn't really get that talked about. Half of New York is living in Atlanta right now. Well, the, my friends in Atlanta want y'all to know that Atlanta's <laughs> closed. So y'all need to come back around and stop, stop coming down. Now, you know, I, Charles Blow is a good friend of mine and Charles just wrote a book uh, uh, the Devil You Know, um, which is a great book. It was new, number nine on the New York Times bestsellers list. It was funny. I told Charles, I said, man, Charles, you've got to get the number four because they're three books that's going to be that's just going to outsell yours. Barack Obama, Michelle Obama and Cicely Tyson. So you got to get the number four. <laughs> um, but he made it the number nine, which is a huge accomplishment. And he examines this migration and reverse migration. There are a lot of black folk and it, you know, it has to do with the urban center of Atlanta. Um, but I mean, you know, the organizing that was done by people like Cliff Albright and uh, Latasha Brown over at Black Voters Matter, the organizing that was done by Fair Fight and Stacey Abrams, they not only just organized Atlanta, though, and they organized everywhere in Atlanta, too. Now, they organized from, you know, the strip clubs to the churches and they got everybody in between. But it was also the rural areas that they went to. There was a there was not a stone unturned and they flipped not since Jimmy, but since it was 1992, it was uh, Bill Clinton the last person to win in Georgia. Oh, that's right. That's right, Bill Clinton. And lastly, uh, you mentioned her and I want to just kind of close with her because she was kind of the hero of the 2020 election, depending on which side you're on. But what, speak to the power of Stacey Abrams. I mean, that's what you, that's what happens when you come from HBCUs. I mean, this is what we expect. You know, Yogananda Pittman, the new chief of police at uh, the United States Capitol. Uh, uh, um, you, you got Kamala, you got Raphael Warnock. Um, you have the new, in Joyce Beatty, the new incoming chair of the CBC went to Cheney State and Stacy. And Stacy just tells you that she shows you that, you know, it's, it's, you know, winning and losing is not about the candidate as much as it is about going in and organizing uh, the voters in that particular area and doing everything you can to create a culture and an excitement and an understanding at registering and doing all those things that are necessary um, to uh, to get the voter base where they need to be.
Okay, we hear the pitter patter of your twins, and they, we, they are they are fully uh, awake. Yeah, fully awake. <laughs> it's beautiful to hear them. But one last quick question: I want to get this in from Cynthia Joseph Keller. How do we address 100 proposals to suppress voting rights to reduce Democratic voters? Got to get that in. Voting. Well, I mean, I think that one of the most, and this is going to be tough for us because we didn't do what we needed to do. Um, in state legislatures across the country. The most important aspect, the most important election we had was the one that just passed. That's because that's where, um, you know, for the next 10 years, power will be divided based upon the laws we draw, the lines we draw every 10 years. And those lines, people will start drawing those lines, you know, momentarily across the country. And Republicans control 33 state houses, I believe. Um, and so that's gonna be very difficult. And when you look at the gerrymandering, when you look at the gentrification and all those things, and more so gerrymandering than anything else, um, that it, that's the real reason that we're losing power in these particular areas, in voting power. But I think that Stacy taught us one thing, which is that you have to create organizations, grassroots organizations, which are positioned to, to fight back. And um, the first thing um, that I would encourage Cynthia to do is make sure that, you know, whether or not it's Akeem Jeffries or whether or not it's uh, Congressman Meeks up there, or, or even if it's uh, my good friend Chuck Schumer up there, make sure that they pass the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act bill. It's the most important piece of legislation we have in the United States Congress and be an active participant in making sure that happens. It's a great way to end in memory of John Lewis. Bakari Sellers, we're so proud of you. Keep speaking truth to power on CNN and take care of those beautiful twins. I will keep me in your prayers. Have a great day. Thank you. Appreciate Bye. you. Okay. Thanks everyone. And don't go away because we're going to tell you how to get a free book of my vanishing country. We're also going to have a survey we would love that if you filled out our survey. So here's how we're going to gift these books to you. Ready? The first 15 people to send their name or send an email to this email will get a free book. So shoot an email to that email, that's not my email, but I am. I do have access to it. And we are going to notify you by email if you're a winner. And we are going to send you a copy of the HarperCollins bestseller, My Vanishing Country. And lastly, if you could fill out this survey so we can stay on our A game and continue to bring you more great programming, we would be most grateful. We appreciate you so much tuning in today on behalf of Spectrum News, York College, the Greater Queens Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. We appreciate you. Have a wonderful day and special shout out to Dr. Jonathan Quash for making this wonderful stream yard happen for us today. Stay safe, everyone. And thanks again.